Okay, I am, I'm excited about this technology. Never thought those words would come out of my mouth. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you guys have had a chance to look at the handouts. Uh, they came a little late, I apologize for that. And the blurb, so this is hands on for the first 20 to 30 minutes, depending on feedback. And then it's gonna be followed by a 10 minute slideshow that I will be talking over top of so hopefully the audio and the video will work together um on my blurb and i want to reiterate this is a down and dirty unseal this is not purest unseal but part of what i want to do is show you five other manuscripts that are um within a few hundred years of each other and show that there is no pure unseal. What you are looking for with this alphabet is lovely, clear lines with a few ascenders and descenders and a sense of balance, very much a balance. So when I played around with this alphabet, what I have based it on and I'm going to put it here. It's based on um, circles, circles and lines. And when we look at the other manuscripts, you will see some lettering that looks like this and some that doesn't. Um, and I won't bore you with too many details before we pick up our pens, but there is unseal, there is half unseal, there is insular school, there is slanted unseal, there is flat pen unseal. We use that word for many, many things, but I would say what we're looking at is an alphabet that doesn't have upper and lower case. There is only one, um, one form for each letter. And I say that with a, uh, cause you're gonna see different types of Bs. You'll see different types of Es. You'll be like that G doesn't look the same, but within the manuscripts, those letters are consistent. Between manuscripts, you're going to see changes. Um, Mika gave me a fantastic link to a calligrapher um, that works under Ink Me Blue. Not Ink Me This, but Ink Me Blue. And she has um, blogs on different courses she's taken. And the one that Ewan Clayton does um, deals with just this. Unseal is not cut in stone. Literally, it's not cut in stone. It was never considered a monumental script. It's a book script. And it, we get, my hope is after we do this is a little more freedom and a little more confidence. Um, I did not get into contemporary unseal because I'm looking at the clock. I got my watch here because we don't have enough time but you can play around with these letter forms and you will start to develop an eye for what goes together because there is a lot, oh, there's just um, within the 27 letters, there is a lot of wiggle room. Okay, so that's my little blurb. Okay, we're gonna have our paper in front of us. Mine is gonna be off to the side. Oh, and look at all these pens. You don't have to have all of these. These are dip pens. I've done this as a C1 and a C2 because can't do anything without C2s if you have them. The ones that work together with these, and there are extras at the front for people here if you want to borrow a parallel pen. Um, the 2.4 and the 3.8, the light yellow, the light orange and the green are ones that work fairly closely with this and this is all about fairly closely we are not purist today and then we're going to play around at the end with some really narrow like a pencil a monoline or a fountain pen that was buried in the little blurb fountain pens are really fun and you can use them as dip pens you usually find them at garage sales or you can find them at um staples Okay, so choose the tool you want. You can just choose to do one. Um, and we'll start with the basic alphabet and then we're gonna look a little bit at St. Cuthbert's and how small and light St. Cuthbert's was. And then we'll do the slideshow. Look at that. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip. I am gonna start 
with a C2, because that's the classic. I have, um, I'm going to try and, whoops, sorry, just there. that good? Because yeah. I think it will be big enough to see. If it's not big enough to see on your screen, let me know and I'll move over to the C1. So, um, and if you have parallel pens, those work as well and just use those. So I'm going to move this down a bit. We're just going to zip through this um, in order. Um, because we all, I think, have a basic understanding of calligraphy. This is loosely based on uh, Linda's Farm, a big gospel you'll be seeing in a bit. And it's a bit of a slanted ooh, unseal, half unseal. Um, the A that I've chosen to do because it's easiest to teach is at an angle, it comes down as a little thing off. And then I've done it as a loop. You are gonna see when we look at the manuscripts, a lot of different ways to do the A's. And if you wanna experiment, please feel free. This alphabet is based on circles and sticks. We, uh, when I do it at schools, we do a popsicle sticks to start, which was Betty Locke's brilliant idea. And so these are A's, they come at a bit of an angle. Um, it's a relatively flat padding pen angle, which I got to remind myself of because I keep going to, so it's about a five degree angle if you're trying to do it well. And then you're going to notice as you do this, especially with the edge tool, there's a temptation to go like this, which works. We're going to see a manuscript where they've gone like this and then just on a little tiny blurb at the end, like this. Okay. It looks good to me up there. Okay, so we'll see different variations. That's what we're going to see afterwards. At this point, we're working on this. Now, the B um, I like as an example because it's that curved bottom that's done in one stroke. It's and you go a little above the line, and you come and you swoop down. It's it's. This is a very lovely gentle script. You go back in the ink and pull it around. And you make a nice round circle. Um, there is a slight slant to the left. Um, I have done proper unseal with Dennis Brown, the Irish calligrapher. So he, he dismissively calls this Irish pub unseal. And I actually have pictures of Irish pubs unseal in the slideshow. I like putting serifs on these because Linda Svarn does. Um, it just indicates that you're not trying to do kindergarten printing. This is actually a script that you're working on. It has a certain flow. I'm going to come up to this end. So if you do your serif by coming across and then down, it slows you down a bit and then you can fill it in at the end. And I'm going to do that again because it shows up a lot and it reminds you to hold your pen as flat as you can because for me, at least I have a tendency to start going like making it narrower and doing this. And that's not what it is. Um, Dennis Brown gets quite dramatic with the serifs. I do not. Okay, so um, the C is lovely and you can see it starts uh, about 1130, I'm gonna say, where you've got a really narrow, narrow start there and it comes around and comes over. Um, you'll see that people can play around with this as well. The D, the D is lovely and calligraphers forever. I'm gonna say from the 400s on, from one of the earliest manuscripts, you can see people having fun, fun with this one. I can do it like this. I'm gonna just not use my calligraphy for a second. Um, talking about fun, I'm like, Whoop. this is um, Linda's farm. These are B's, they're not D's. But speaking of fun, you can see how those serifs get little tails. We'll look at serifs later that have little curly cues on them. This is just, I love this alphabet because it was done like 1800 years ago. And you just have a sense of a human being behind this who is enjoying making these lovely fluid shapes. And in this case, they get to decorate them too. 
usually the person doing the calligraphy didn't get to decorate. And I think that's why they started doing little curly cues and little fish tails. And I find it a very personal script. Okay, so the D we're gonna see in different forms, even a square form later. The E is your C starting 1130 as soon as you can. Okay, I'm doing terribly with this ink, but um, like I said, down and dirty and a cross piece. You are gonna see E's where they have come around come around like this and gone all the way out. You can, you can see E's where they've come around, they haven't attached it and they've gone out. There is a lot of play in this. These are basic forms. You can see E's more contemporary where they've made them into a curve and this way. Um, the F's are really interesting. They tend to go below the bar in the manuscripts. Uh, Irish pubs tend to put them above, but we're going to pull ours below and it has a serif again, but the serif is a little lower so that you can do a beautiful arc and have a low crossbar and um, it creates a sense of space in the, um, in the lettering. I'm going to just pull this one back again. Sorry, I keep doing this. But if you look at these, you can see the uh, counter spaces, the insides are quite lovely and open and not always exactly the same either. Like um, what you're looking for is a flow. These are done at about um, five millimeters height, which is bigger than St. Cuthbert's. Um, this is a, a nice, loose, beautiful hand. Um, they had lots of calf skins to go with because the king had given them more land so they could grow 2,000 calves because they were going to need that to make that book. So they were um, feeling like they had lots of room. Um, the G, so I think even as we get to this part, you can see how much of this is circles and a little bit of an angle and then um, a hook on the G. There is another fun G you will see in uh, Irish pubs where the G comes across. It's not quite as big. It comes down like this and it goes like this. And you can start to see where our G's come from. This says um, obviously um, base of a lot of our typefaces. Okay, H is also above the line. It did the serif you come down and this one comes down straight it does not have the little loopy curve like the b's and the l's will and then i do a by by h i'm really getting into it it's big it's loose it has a little tail um which purists don't like um if you're looking into more stuff and if you look in the manuscripts it does have the serif in some of them and they tend to come across and just leave it as a point which is totally up to you. I is quite self-explanatory. Um, it does have a serif, it comes down and pulling it below the line just so you can see the serif. Eyes were J's, they didn't have a J. So we will see like the um, Gospel of John, which is what St. Cuthbert's Gospel is. It's just the Gospel of John. And John, the J for John looks like this. Um, because we don't live in the 700s, our J's now just have the tiniest pull at the bottom. Or if you're feeling like that isn't good enough, you can do the little curly Q things to make them fancy. You, but you wouldn't do a fancy curly Q if the rest of your letters were a little more serene. But if you're doing these you know, little tails and you're getting into the Irish pub and you're drinking whiskey, then this is likely what your J's can look like and they'll match, okay? <laughs> and K is another one of a little bit of a made up letter. It shows up a lot of medieval count uh, manuscripts, but not so much in these early unseals. And these are like uh, 400s, 700s, 800s. That's what I'm talking when I talk about unseal. Um, we'll see a manuscript from the 400s where this unseal is already well established. And over the next few hundred years, there are little tweaks, but generally um, you would use a bigger unseal for the capital letters when you're getting fancy pants. And I'm just trying to see a fancy pants one. You just have to trust me on that for now. 
I'll just bring this one out again. Um, so when you're trying to make something fancy, you would just do a bigger letter, add a little curly cues to it, add some dots and some colors, but you, in the written part of it, you wouldn't make fancy. On the front pages, you go wild, but um, it's nice and legible and people are reading this out loud, so that it needs to be legible. The K, I've, because you get to choose on the K because it's not there. I chose to make it quite big at the top to keep that openness in the um, counter space and then kick up on the outside because that is gonna reference to the R's that you'll see with a little below the line kick up that um, just adds a little fluidity. And, and here's our L, which is gonna look a lot like the beginning of the B and it has a little serif I forgot to put in. That's good reminder, come in and go around. And I think I mentioned that Lindisfarne is at five millimeters. Cuthbert's, which is this other handout, this is from Cuthbert's, they're at two and a half millimeters, which is why the fountain pen or the pencil was suggested. And I have tried to directly go across um, at home, I've done this and overlaid it on a light table and just traced over it with a fountain pen because um, the uh, Speedball 5 is not too bad. Um, and because I wanted to remind people how small these letters are, we work at this site. This is more or less the size we're working at the bottom of this. But if you look, I've left, this is a centimeter scale here. So that's one centimeter. And I think when we're doing this lettering, um, I want to remind people how small it was so that we don't get too hung up on doing it at C2 height perfectly. This was tiny lettering, uh, like a typeface. And even back to Linda's farm, because I like it, even at a half centimeter, it's still tiny. Like you can see my finger, you can like you would be using a um, C5 or four on these ones. Um, it's done small. And the, um, the miracle of this writing is when you enlarge it, I think this is enlarged five times, um, it's still beautiful. Like the, it takes my breath away. Um, and I'm just going to say the E's are bigger here because they would often attach it to the T next to it. Um, and when they were running out of space, because even though there's lots of space left, there were clear margins, like you can see them in the manuscripts, we'll see them. And they didn't want to go by them. So that's an N with a T stuck on it, right? It wasn't perfection like fonts. And we're so used to seeing fonts. This is um, playing around on our, on the um, slideshow, we'll look at it a little bit more, but you can see where they have added letters to letters to squinch it in so that this imaginary line here is kept. So you, um, it's um, it's all about working with people and making it making it work for the people, not making it work for the computer. So the M is my latest theory. This M is is not sorry. This is down and dirty. So you, I, you would come down like this. And then a lot of the M's have a little tail on them when you go in, a little weight in the middle. And then the other one usually just flicks in. When I was doing this a long time ago, the uh, handout, I am um, heavily influenced by the Irish thing and maybe a bit of pushback against. I would do a little thing like that because it's kind of cool and it is like, I'm not just doing, um, like primary lettering, this is deliberate. And what I find interesting is M's and E's are kind of like, um, people may remember doing E's like this, these curly E's, which are a little bit like the M on the side. And then as they got straighter, I've actually seen M's that are straighter like this as well. It's kind of cool. You just, um, it's fun to look at different ways people have made letters that we can still read. Um, and that was etched in stone at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Okay, N, you're going to notice that this is, I think, what they would call like a half, half unseal N. I like it because it goes in with this alphabet like this. 
Um, you're going to see a lot of what we call capital ends in the manuscripts, but this fits nicely with what we're doing here. And it's way easier to do with smaller pen size, which I'm going to talk faster. Okay, the O fairly flat again. It's the C, it's the A, I'm speeding up. The P, I've actually seen the P's where the serif is lower, the P comes out the top. And I've also seen it where the P isn't closed off. Um, so it just comes like this and it has a little thing like that. I've seen them um, where the P is up tight and doesn't go all the way down. Um, this P fits with what we're doing and I'm skipping every line because that is how St. Cuthbert's was um, put out. And now I can, oh, and the Q, the Q, this comes down, goes out backwards, and I um, did that little backwards, doop, and comes around. Okay, I can come get near the end. Let me do a better one of that. It's a circle to start, and I do like making them as a circle. It comes down from there. It goes out with the serif and comes down, and does hang a bit about. The R is a lovely letter. It has a very big bowl. And it comes down to the bottom and then it kicks out. And sometimes the stem goes down lower and sometimes it doesn't. But this little kick is why there's a little kick on the K when I, K's didn't exist in Celtic times. The S is very cool. Um, the Ink Me Blue lady has a whole thing on pen angles and changing and this and that. And I'm like, if you were doing this S at three millimeter height, I think you would just hope the quill could do it all for you because quills have a lot more flexibility than our pens, which is how some of these letters are formed. It tends to have a bigger top than a bottom in some of the manuscripts. But if you are, and it's done with the middle part first, it scoops over the top and it comes underneath. And when you look at a lot of manuscripts, you can see because they don't always join them up really well. It was the middle, the top and the bottom or the bottom and the top. I have chosen to do this T, which you will see some way in some places, but um, down and dirty. And this, we just pull a top over. Um, in the manuscripts, you're gonna see serifs, you're gonna see joining. And the, a lot of the T's in the manuscripts are straight with a little curve and a lovely little thing like this. But for this, I'm gonna say bastard type alphabet, we're sticking with circles, we're making it round and we make it big and short. Um, so they're done at three and a half to four pen heights. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, there is a Y that, oh, X, X's are done in different ways. X's stood for tens um, is how they made the number 10 as well. So there are many, many different ways to do X's because I, my theory is the monks were getting bored because they would do rows of X's for different calendars and stuff and different labeling the, um, they were labeled in columns and X's. So you'd be doing a hundred of X's. So this is just a basic one based on circles, but you are gonna see just an abundance of X's as um, different calligraphers allowed themselves to Play a bit and you would see x's like this and you see them going right down so it's quite fun the y i've kept like a u here um, in the olden days so it can have the straight coming down and um and if you are uh drinking whiskey and you get little serifs in here the y can come down with a curly q like this but then you would make your, your G look like that as well with the curly key coming down. You would, you're trying to match the letters, I think is one way of, of saying it. Um, okay, and the Zs are fun. They were kind of a, there was a, a letter in old, there was a letter that was called a Zoth that had lots of loops on it like this. And the Z kind of started to stand in for stuff. And, but you can see in some of the manuscripts, you'll see this is why we play around with the ends a little bit sometimes. Even the monks would play around with the ends because they could still remember their little Zoth-ish letter. 
in the back of my mind, I'm imagining Betty going, it's not quite right, Lucy. <laughs> but I'm all about good enough. So we have zipped through this alphabet with whatever tool you have chosen, the C ones, the C things. Um, because my watch is going, keep going, I'm going to take the... Oh, I'm so sorry. The V didn't really exist. The V um, was a U back then, and they would also use it for a U, which makes some of the manuscripts very confusing. The V I've chosen to do because I wanted to stick with angles is I angled this way and I tried to make the base of it go around. And you could put a serif on it, sorry. The W's were curvy. They didn't have the, they um, would, and it would be very similar, like it should look like an upside down M if you're doing it properly. It takes a lot of space. Um, and, uh, and that was a little bit how you showed how rich your, um, by the time you're getting to the 800s, there were books that were a half meter long, 35 centimeters wide and would weigh pounds, like up to 70 pounds when they were all together. St. Cuthbert, had a little, um, we'll see a picture of it and you can see the size. It was light. It was like a 165 grams, like a family size chocolate bar, light. But these other ones were bigger. The writing was still small because they were writing out the gospels and the Bible. Um, other manuscripts that chants and stuff came off that I got to see are huge. Those letters are well over an inch big. By the time they're starting to do that kind of manuscript, they're done in black letter or further along. Um, and they were condensing the letters a bit because they were making them so big so that people who were chanting could see, see things. But what we're dealing with today with the unseal is um, small lettering, sometimes done in big books. St. Cuthbert's is small lettering in a small book, I'm trying to limit limit how much I'm doing. So speak, what a great segue. Look at this fantastic handout, a little blurb on the side. Um, during the uh, 10 minute show, we will, I'll show you where the, that line comes in. Um, because this is easy to read, because we have computers, there's Latin to English translations everywhere. You can look at any bit of Latin done, and that was main. That was what Unseal was doing. There is um, Unseal is Latin, and um, you can type it into the translator in Google, and it will tell you what you're reading. It is so much fun um, because I happen to know the Bible quite well. You can pick things out even without the translator, which just feels very cool to me. So before we go to the very short video. I'd like you to take a pencil or a fountain pen. Mine is loaded. There are uh, two fountain pens up here. If anybody wants to try with a fountain pen and a dip, these have to be dipped because um, I only loaded the cartridge on this one. Fountain pens are amazing. Um, they don't do thins very well, but um, why I, I did this page was just wanting to stress how small this was, um, which in some ways is some freedom because you don't notice the mistakes as much. These guys just didn't make mistakes. It was, it was un, unreal, um, but we might make some mistakes. So just with a pencil or with a very narrow nib or a fountain pen that you can dip, I want you to use these lines um, this is pretty much to size. If you hold the ruler against these centimeters, they're as close as I could possibly make it. This is what that book would be. This is St. Cuthbert's book. Um, and I wanted, just before we start looking at other manuscripts, I just wanted us to get a, a feel for how small this was. Um, in Cuthbert's, they're working on every other line. A hundred years later, uh, this one doesn't show it as well as Kel's. Mm, there you have 
two x heights between them and it's a nice it is a very nice hand to lay out because what you're dealing with is x heights the the space between the lines here is the same as the space that you're writing in so it's just either or either or as they got bigger books had more space there is actually this is half a centimeter sorry thank you this is so handy this is about this is half a centimeter this is two centimeters so when the poor the poor um scribe whose job it was to line over a thousand pages um they would just make marks as they went down and that would be what they would they would use the same marks to create their braids and their decorations as well they fit within so it was either a single line this one isn't as easy to see but this is a double line it has writing in between which is makes it harder to understand but we will see a manuscript where it's very easy to see that they started to spread out the letters spread out the lines so that um with these big books and as the books got bigger they would also do columns often because it's easier to keep your space. These are dark churches. So they were trying for let, it was dark back then, right? There wasn't a lot of light and candles. So what they were looking for is stuff that was easy to read that had lots of light within the, the lettering itself. Black letter that comes next is called black because it got squished and became very dense and very hard to read on the page. So at this point in the 800s and beforehand, um, they are using lots of space. And I just realized, I don't know if you can see it there, but these little X's, you can see how they have little flicks off the end because you're writing a lot of X's. And uh, sometimes you would forget letters and stick them in. So the X's, um, they're great manuscripts to study. So hopefully while I've been chattering away, you guys have zoom in even more. Okay, thank you. Oh, this is amazing. So just see, if you pick a line, any line. Um, see if you can figure out any of the um, lettering. Okay, this is where, this is mainly to show us how hard this is to do. I will demonstrate how hard it is to do by doing a fairly terrible job. Um, but, uh, it is so small and they would, um, the book of, anyhow, um, books were unbelievably expensive. They were worth as much as manor houses and, um, um, and they were works of God. They, they, um, St. Cuthbert's book is, um, considered a miracle because it was still intact when they opened his, um, coffin after about 300 years and um, and it was a lot of books were considered miraculous there's stories about healing because of the book so the books aren't how we imagine books now there was a a sacredness a, a magic to them and there was all kinds of stories about how they survived being in water or how they um, not just the uh, Cuthbert's um, but Cuthbert's is very, very special. Um, that's not too bad. Um, it, it's, um, there's just so much in them. The, so you can see these bigger letters are just basically the large stretched out version of unseals. And I don't have time to do it now, but with these with these bigger guidelines, trying to do the letter forms in a narrow pen or a pencil um, is really helpful, I think. You get some ideas, you get, it's, it's down to bare bones, right? And you can uh, try out different things. And a lot of the more don't, get stuck on the three and a half to four pen widths. Um, play around with these. They can bounce quite easily. They're easy to read. Our eye 
they're so similar to our lowercase letters that our eye will pick them up. And then you throw in a few fancy T's or funny looking G's just to, to show that this is um, connected to unseal. The, the D's are, and the B's are really fun to play with. Okay. I'm looking at the time because that clock is slow. Um, and it is a 10, nine minutes and 47 seconds of more of me talking. So I had to learn a bit of honey tea. So there's stuff to play with. On this handout, I've just put the manuscript number at the British Library. Um, if you are at all interested in links, um, Ink Me Blue has some really cool links um, to the manuscripts under the Unseal one. Um, I have really cool links to different ones. What we can find online at library sites um, all over the world is phenomenal for, for studying stuff. Um, the British Library is the best at putting measurements next to their things so you get an idea of how big the books are. Um, which is really helpful because we work in C2 a lot um, and not that we're going to be doing teeny tiny pages of stuff but I have seen a contemporary calligrapher um, at a fairly recent conference do a book in this writing because you can do this writing small it's legible, we can read it, and um, it's a little bit contemplative once you get into it, because you can just keep it at a fairly natural angle, figure out what they're going to do, and go from there. Okay, the video. Video. we're going to switch to a video, and I will talk over top of it, because okay. I didn't have time to do voiceover. Um, I just have to do some stuff here. Yeah, and so this is a pens down. I promise it's not that long. Um, my, I promise there's actually not that many travel uh, photos in here. What I was really concentrating on was St. Cuthbert's Way as a pilgrimage, much like the Camino is a pilgrimage, except it's only a hundred kilometers, which <laughs> thank God. Um, and um, the abbeys um, that are ruined were, were built hundreds of years after we imagine St. Columbus, sorry, St. Cuthbert, there was a St. Columba as well, St. Cuthbert meandering along. What is phenomenal when you do this walk is a lot of these abbeys were built on earlier abbeys. So what you're seeing now isn't what Cuthbert would have probably walked through, but it would have been very similar. They're along river valleys. Um, they were places um, that took in people from all walks of life in a way. Um, they were centers of education and stability. Um, and they were almost like a little city within a city during some times that were pretty fraught, either because of the Vikings coming in in the 700s or the Scottish border wars that seem to go on forever. And the nice thing about St. Cuthbert's, oh good, is it up? Yeah. Okay, um, so the first picture, I don't know if we're on the first picture. Yeah. Oh, the bat. The ba yeah. So um, there's a cross, St. Cuthbert's cross, because this is based on the, um, what he was buried with and it was um, on his chest plate. And it looked like that. And this writing is, um, it's made to look old fashioned. It's not Celtic, Celtic, it's not versatile. So this is, this is England. This is where Cuthbert was, except in the next one, we imagine a lot of stuff is imagining. There are a lot of stories. So we can see Iona in the far, up in the left there. And we can see St. Cuthbert's Way at the bottom right. Okay, and now we're looking at Cuthbert's and this is the trail that I did with my husband all the way out to Holy Island. It is stunning, it is beautiful, it's pastoral. And because of the background with the Celtic stuff, you can see a lot of the writing done in um, 
Celtic writing. So this is one of the abbeys. Um, the roof is off, so it's a lot airier. And this was built in the 1300s. And so we walked from, ab from ruined abbey to ruined abbey. There would have been smaller places there beforehand. They, um, they are breathtaking, breathtaking. And you get an idea of how big they are. And because the roof's off, and so these are just starting to show the lettering. And, and so we're in Scotland right now, and it's almost a little bit of their culture, a little bit of the politics is we're gonna use Celtic writing. Unseals are really connected with the Celtic and the history. So when you're celebrating the history of your place, writing is a way of doing it. So um, I'm, this is in Lindisfarne, the Holy Island. So St. Mary, this is built near another ruin. This is the other ruin that is also built. This has been a holy island for a long time and things are built on top of other things. And the history, that's a, a castle that was not there when Cuthbert was there. It was a very much a farm, like Linda's farm. Farm means farm. This is in Cuthbert's gospel. Um, originally had fairly gaudy coloring, but this is what was left of it. And you can see it fits in your hand. So less than 200 grams, it um, was painted. It has survived, like it was written in the 700s. It has survived it, partly because it was, it is a bit of a miracle that it was in the coffin with a dead body that more or less mummified itself. This is the walk to Lindisfarne. You do it at low tide. Uh, it's a North Sea, so the North Sea, even at low tide, is very cold and very muddy. And it does feel uh, like a bit of a penance, <laughs> walking, <laughs> walking to there. Oh my God, it was, um, but totally worth it. Now, these are five manuscripts. This was written in the 400s. Uh, the Bodleian Library in Oxford has it. It's, you can see it online. This is Cuthbert's, written in the 700s. Um, tiny little book. The next book coming up is the Amianet. I can never quite pronounce it. This is a bigger book, still down about three or four. I don't know if you can see the difference in the writing. We're going to come back to it. Um, that I got from the Library of Congress. This is Kells. Most people know Kells, and you can see the spacing is starting to get bigger. There's more decorations on the page, a little more money in the 800s. And this is Lindisfarne, which is big. This is in here. It's like a ledger size piece of paper, and that is at the British Library. Then I wanted to show some contemporary signs that you see. This is in Lindisfarne, it's in Scotland, because there is such a connection to this letter forms. And you can see, you can see that it's like, oh, this is unseal, not the unseal that's perfect, but certain letters like the S or the A, I love the A in Northumberland. It's a little thing, the D that comes over. So these are how people have taken this old lettering, made it contemporary. So what I love about this, so the, it's mainly the E in this is like, I'm Celtic, I'm in Edinburgh. They didn't actually have these, but it's, it's and this, is what is on, wait for it, there, they call them wheelie bins and um, that's what the wheelie bins have a lovely little Celtic thing on them. And wheelie bins come in, I love calling them wheelie bins. It's, it's still a part of the culture. It has lasted forever. So the wheelie bins sometimes hide the signs of St. Cuthbert's way. There's my husband. St. Cuthbert's goes through towns, which means it goes through back alleys, it goes, up roadways, it goes through hedgerows and, and rock walls when you get further up into the Midlands. And people, when they have these, this is on the cottage called the Scaries. And when you start seeing, um, I was very disappointed that the St. Cuthbert's Way signs are not done in Unseal. They're done in a very lovely uppercase. And they will, part of St. Cuthbert's Way is the Roman pass. And the Roman pass would have existed when he was there. And that's part of the reason that these monks would show up in France. They would show up in Italy. They would come from Iona, that little tiny island, um, because of the Roman roads. 
So this is from the 400s. This is, uh, I think, one of the earliest good scripts with it. This is a close-up of it. The top is done in a um, kind of Romans, but you can, because we've been working on that letter forms, you can see it. This is in one of the inns we were in, and you can see. So what I'm doing for these last few minutes is just going back and forth. This is this. This is the lettering in Cuthbert's, and we're going to do a close up where we can see I baptize in water because I thought that was like so cool. Oh, yeah. And then we'll go to another contemporary sign. Oh, this is me showing how they would squish them in because there was an imaginary line where you would stop and you could see they would stick to the same line in the back. And then this was at a whiskey place where they have a little muse museum, and um, this is the font they are using there. This is the Ammonitis one. So still single spacing back and forth. Um, but you can see how flat the pen angle is. And I wanted to get really close because I was hoping you could see the little fishtails on the corners of the E's there. And the pointy A's, which I didn't point out there, but you can see here the pointy A's at this one. We're going to see another one. They have some The, um, it's, so this is what you could refer to as, it was a Scottish pub, Scottish pub stuff. Now this is Kells with the beautiful decorations. And we're gonna see a lot of Kells because this is where you can see them playing with the Ds. Can you see the D that's square, but you can still read as a D. Can you see the curly cues on the ends of the little fishtails and the flowers? And then this one here, you can see the R with a little kick up. You can see a P that has this huge, huge things. You can see curly cues. And if you look at the H there, um, and it's hiding that I that's a J for Jerusalem. I, I, um, this is a Y. Depro, and that's a, a funny looking little Y because they played around. Um, with it there. Can you see the little cowlick in the blue D? Can you see the fancy X that fits into a lower serif B? And then we go here, and this is using the, the, the curvy L's and the lovely ends that I like. And then because it's got the flick, there's another one there, you can see how the flick in the E is carried, carried through on the N and the W where they put a serif there. So People are still playing with these letters. It's my favorite, the um, Lindisfarne. It's a big book, letter, um, ledger size, split in two. Um, it's got old English in between it, which was very helpful when people were trying to figure out what old English sounded like, because um, you knew what letters they were. Scottish gemstones, a little bit of Celtic, um, not work. It was, Really, this is um, like Edinburgh, Scotland just celebrates this lettering. It's everywhere, it is still contemporary. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.